Hello, <clears throat> welcome. I'm Josh McHour. Uh, I'm uh, the director of uh, Stanford Buyers Center for Biodesign um, and uh, co-founder. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, host, uh, be one of the hosts for this um, uh, great presentation today. You know, this is the uh, first of what I hope many um, opportunities to bring to the community um, content relating to very important processes and policies associated with innovation. And um, we're so pleased to have this partnership and involvement with um, the American Medical Association to deliver this content today to all of you. And I really think it represents a huge reach out uh, for the American Medical Association to the community. Um, you know, I've had the great pleasure of working with the folks at AMA um, through a number of the uh, uh, changes that uh, have been implemented in, in favor of innovation, in favor of innovators and patients and, and physicians over the last couple of years. It's been a, a truly great pleasure. And, uh, and so uh, this is sort of the culmination, maybe the first of, of many opportunities for us to collaborate on bringing important um, uh, content for all of you so that you can better serve your patients. So um, I'll first, uh, you know, introduce our, our my co-host, uh, Andrew Cleland here um, and to say a few words and then I'll, I'll get us started. So Andrew. Thanks, Josh. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, I'm Andrew Cleland, CEO of Fogarty Innovation. Uh, on behalf of the, the team at Fogarty Innovation, we're thrilled to co-host today's meeting. Uh, really looking forward to uh, further discussing and hearing about all the efforts to make the AMA coding process more transparent, hopefully a little more reasonable, particularly to the, the early companies. Uh, I really want to thank Laurie and her team for, for doing this today. Really appreciate the outreach uh, and the involvement. Uh, and also want to thank you, Josh, for uh, all your efforts over the last few years in, in trying to, to get to where we are today. So thank you and very much looking forward to this. Thanks, Andrew. So um, before we get started, I just want to thank some very important uh, folks and, um, and organizations that helped uh, get us all together today. Um, certainly, uh, AdvaMed, MDMA, SVB, uh, MedTech Strategists, uh, Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich Rizzotti, and of course, uh, the American Medical Association and our partners, uh, the Fogarty uh, uh, Innovation Group. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, Annette uh, Iwanich and, uh, and also Ken Hermano, who without their, all their work, we wouldn't be here today. So um, without any further ado, I wanna introduce you to uh, Lori McGraw. Lori is the Senior Vice President of Health Solutions um, at AMA. And in that role, she's basically oversees CPT. And, um, Lori is really unique in that she is herself an innovator. She's played a number of really very interesting roles in, in tech, actually, um, and also healthcare, uh, roles at uh, Channel Health and also all scripts and leadership roles. And she brings a really unique take on, on, on AMA, and, she, and you can feel, feel the uh, enthusiasm and momentum already through her efforts. It's been a real pleasure um, to work with Lori, and, and I really think she's an agent for positive change. And I think some of you may already be seeing that, and I, I have great expectations for what's to come. So this is, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce you, Lori. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate that. And it's, it's always uh, um, great to hear from Josh because I know he's always teeing me up because he wants something next. Um, and um, I always like to remind him, you're welcome for the positive change that we've achieved yeah. together. Um, I really do appreciate being here. Um, this is a Friday, a Friday afternoon. Um, so for all of the innovation crowd who is on the phone on a Friday afternoon that you would be spending with it, um, that time with us to be talking about CPT, which we view as a foundational language for innovation, um, we're really pleased to have this opportunity. So um, what are we going to do? We have about 90 minutes of um, time together 
a little bit more, where we want to share quite a bit of information about CPT, laying some groundwork to make sure that you understand this foundational language. So as Andrew said, and Andrew, thank you as well for the, um, the opening introduction, um, that it is transparent. You understand how to work with it. You understand where to go for questions so that your innovations, as you're bringing them into healthcare, that they are used in ways that physicians and healthcare um, and consumers trust um, that have the opportunity, if there's value associated with them, that they can be, um, have things where they're trusted, where they, they have the right protocols so that there's not li um, uh, liability issues, so that they are embedded into workflows, and also that they support important things in terms of outcomes for patients and advancing health equity and not bringing new burdens um, into um, you know, what is the interface with physicians um, and their patients. So what we're going to do in, in this time is I'm going to provide a bit of an overview about the AMA. I'm going to go um, a little bit into CPT. And then my team, Leslie Prelwitz in particular, an expert in the world of CPT, is going to walk you through some fundamentals. Um, I Okay, so let me introduce the team that is here with me today um, from the AMA. Myself, Senior Vice President of Health Solutions. I've been with the AMA for five and a half years. I come from um, the world of tech and for 25 years working on elect electronic health records. So I understand software, I understand how it's used. And now at the AMA, I understand the process of coding, reimbursement, payment, and policy and the work of the AMA in that regard. Jay Allman is on the line. Jay Allman is the Vice President of Coding Policy and Strategy. He's been with the AMA for 20 years. He is an expert in all things um, CPT. And so there really is not a question um, that you can ask Jay that he won't have an answer to as it relates to CPT. So I encourage you to try to stump him. Leslie Prelwitz, who's going to be one of our main presenters, she's the Director of CPT Content Management and Development. She not only supports the process of the development of CPT, but the details of how these codes are both constructed and how they need to be applied and used. And she, um, as you will hear from Leslie, quite the expert. And then Kenyatta Jackson. Kenyatta Jackson is the Health Equity Program Manager for the AMA. We're going to be talking about the AMA's Center of Health Equity Strategic Plan in that regard. And that has a great place in the area of innovation because of the terrific work that you do. We want to ensure that um, as you are building these terrific innovations, that they in fact close those health inequity gaps. And we have both tools, expertise, and we believe CPT can be a conduit for some of that. And so Kenyatta is also on um, the line and she is an absolute expert um, who has joined our team. And we are very excited to have her working, working with us um, in that regard. So I'm going to dive right in and um, keep us moving. So our objectives uh, for what we're going to cover today, uh, broadly, what does the AMA do? I think everyone knows um, the AMA, but it's probably what the AMA does is something that might be a bit less familiar. Um, CPT, what is it? Why should you care for the, for the entrepreneurs, for the innovators, for the technology folks who are on the line with us? Um, it is, uh, it is not just uh, billing codes for reimbursement. CPT is quite a bit more than that. We want to make sure that you have the understanding. So again, for you, the innovations that you're driving, that they can get to the level of adoption and benefit that you are trying to bring to um, patients, consumers, uh, physicians, healthcare workers. Um, the, the capstone course, as we are calling it, CPT, what do you need to know? Who, what, how, and when? Leslie's gonna walk us through the process of CPT. It is our intention to make it quite transparent. It's not behind closed doors. There are some myths about CPT um, as a language that's been around for over 50 years that we're gonna try to debunk. Um, we've done a number of these conversations with the innovation audience. And so we want to address some common questions um, that we get. And then we'll go into Q&A. 
That said, um, please do use the chat, uh, the Q&A feature within the chat. Um, we will be monitoring that. We will be um, making sure that your questions are answered along the way if we can, but we this is meant to be informational for you. Um, we can go very deep in all kinds of areas, but with the time, we absolutely want to, um, we, we want to ensure that we make this uh, the best use of your time. So please ask questions right along the way. I'm going to briefly talk about the AMA. So just moving right along here, um, the AMA, while a 175-year-old organization with a consistent mission of promoting the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health, it is an organization that many folks know that is out there, but ne not necessarily what the AMA does. We think of the AMA as physicians' powerful ally in patient care, and we, we largely do four things. We represent physicians with a unified voice. We are a membership organization. There are over 250,000 members, card-carrying members of um, the AMA, but the AMA represents all physicians. It's an umbrella organization for 180 medical societies. It creates policy. It advocates for things that are important for physicians um, and patients and better outcomes. And um, that is, so it's a policymaking organization. We spend considerable time removing obstacles that interfere with um, patient care. Anything that is in the way of um, a physician and their patient we view as burden um, that turns into burnout. And um, there are an enormous number of issues that continue to um, go in the wrong direction as we look at physicians and healthcare workers with twice the level of burden as other white collar professionals. We spend an enormous effort leading the charge to confront public health crises. Back in the 70s, this was tobacco. Today, it's the opioid crisis. It's hypertension, it's diabetes, and COVID-19, which we are still um, in the midst of. And then driving the future of medicine. Today's capstone um, talk and education is really going to be about driving the future of medicine. CPT, how does that terminology really work to advance innovation? And how do you all, as innovators and leaders um, on that front, use the process of CPT to help you drive your drive your innovation into healthcare. Uh, so, a uh, couple things just uh, of note. This is I don't need to spend time on this at all, but. These are the things that the AMA thinks a lot about. The significant amount of disruption that is already happening in um, healthcare. We've got a lot of direct to consumer consumption of healthcare that's um, happening that has been accelerated in the pandemic. Telemedicine, virtual care has been around for well over a decade, completely um, you know, just uh, adopted at a great pace during the course of the pandemic and will without question continue in large form um, uh, in an enduring uh, manner. We're all seeing the record levels of investment that are happening in digital medicine, AI, genomics, those kind of fast moving areas of, um, of innovation. And we think about that a lot as we do the work in CPT to support the advancement and the adoption in ways that make sense for innovation. Josh mentioned some of the collaborations um, that we have had by listening to audiences like this one to make sure that we as an AMA understand some of the challenges that you are facing and that our rigorous processes adopt at an appropriate pace um, with the same level of rigor, but um, to help advance innovation. Because we know as an AMA, and we know because we study physicians all the time, that the desire for an appetite for innovation is very high. As long as four things um, are true from a physician's perspective, they know that innovation works, they know that they can get paid, they know that they're not going to be sued, and that it works within their workflow. So we are just paying a lot of attention to these types of things. Moving um, right along, oh, this is just simply another slide expressing some of the 
mega changes, macro changes that we, again, are paying attention to as an AMA from both the policy front, as well as some of the work that we do in driving the future of medicine as we focus our um, resources. I wanted to simply highlight for this audience, because it is an audience of innovation, that while the AMA as a um, nonprofit organization that does policy work, that does things like produce CPT and tools and education um, in that area, we also have a Silicon Valley-based innovation company called Health 2047, founded just a few years ago. Um, which is intended to take some of the largest problems in healthcare, working on a few um, focused areas, but also work at a pace of commercial companies. So Health 2047 has already um, spun out five different companies focused on some of these key areas. And again, I'm only bringing that to your awareness because you might not think about the AMA doing things like that in, um, in Silicon Valley but it represents uh, an intentional move to driving that future of medicine, being close with the innovation, innovator community, and really appreciating those mega changes, macro changes that um, I, had, I, I simply highlighted a moment ago. Moving um, right along, we'll move on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I did want to spend one minute, if I could, on the strategic plan from the AMA, from our Center of Health Equity, on, uh, on the Health Equity Strategic Plan. This has been an enormous amount of focus over several years to result in this plan in terms of the focus of the AMA on our commitment to equity and justice. Um, the AMA, a 175-year-old organization with significant power and influence on things like policy, medical education, um, the, the advancing the new physicians who are always coming into the system um, has played an enormous role in healthcare today, including some of those things that have resulted in what is a tremendous amount of health inequity. And so with this strategic plan, we um, have a center of health equity within the AMA that we launched just a few years ago, our inaugural chief health equity officer, Dr. Aletha Maybank, um, who leads this charge for us. And the strategic plan focuses on five key areas, ensuring that we as 1200 people as part of the AMA, that we're embedding equity and racial justice in all the work um, that we do. We, as an AMA, this is big work. We can't do it alone. We do and are building alliances with marginalized physician groups and other stakeholders, critically important. Anything that we can do to take work and push it upstream, you'll hear some of today's conversations fo focusing on things like social determinants of health, which are actually within certain places within um, CPT. We spend quite a bit of time ensuring that there are equitable structures and opportunities in innovation. And this is where we want to ensure that this audience knows about some of these resources that are available to them because this is important work at the AMA. And as you are building new innovation, we want you to be thinking about these things, embedding them in your thinking, where you're testing your workflows so that all humans have optimal opportunity for maximum health outcomes, um, regardless of who they are. So Kenyatta Jackson, as I mentioned, who is on the health solutions team is an expert in this space and works with us to continue to embed this work. We think there's tremendous opportunity in the in innovative space, spaces of digital medicine and the like. All right, moving on to CPT. What is it? Why do you care? It is a language. It's a terminology. It is 10,000 or so codes that represent roughly a trillion dollars of the $3.6 trillion of spend um, in healthcare. It represents innovation. It represents all different parts of medicine. We want you to understand it. We, wanna, we want you to understand why it's important. But to begin the education on CPT, we wanted to start with a quick 
poll to understand the audience's level of um, comfort with CPT. And um, with that, Leslie, tell me how this is going to work. Okay. Afternoon, everybody. Well, I think our, our colleagues at Stanford are going to put a quick poll up on the screen. Uh, don't worry, responses are anonymous, but we know we've got a lot of folks in the audience and want to make sure we level set and make the best use of our time today. So uh, if you could take a moment, there's a poll on the screen and ask to how would you describe your knowledge of the CPT code set and the panel process? And don't worry, they are anonymous responses. So anywhere from beginner, you've never attended a panel meeting, you have a vague understanding of a CPT code. Uh, but no knowledge of the review process all the way up through expert, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, got the wardrobe. So uh, if you could take a minute or so and um, vote with your responses. And uh, Annette and Ken, I'll look to you to see when it looks like we've got uh, most of our responses in. Okay, we'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, uh, can we close the polls and take a look at the results? Oh, 84% so far. All right, let's see what we've got. All right. All right, so a wide variation of the audience, Lori. It looks like uh, about two thirds or so are at the beginner stage and we probably got a couple ringers in the audience. So I'll be expecting some interesting Q&A questions at the end, um, but that's great, great responses. I think we've got a little something for everybody. And uh, before we start, I will say, if you missed something on a slide or it went too quick, don't worry, slides will be available at the end of the presentation. So with that, I guess we can close the poll and uh, Lori, back to you. Great. We're just going to, we'll just go into a little bit about CBT and then we'll go into the details. And as um, Leslie said, the um, slides will be available. So, so please know that. And I already see people using the Q&A um, function. Fantastic. Let the questions come in. If we're going to cover it in a slide, we'll let you know. Um, what, 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 is C, what are CPT codes? We view it as a uniform language of terms and identifying codes to describe current medicine. So the codes are always changing with a rigorous process updated by the independent um, panel process, which we'll go through, meant to accurately describe medical, surgical, and diagnostic services, services and procedures. Um, we think about CPT, we intend for CPT to be open, transparent, in terms of how this um, terminology evolves. Leslie will go through um, how that is. Um, it's effective, it's used universally, nationwide, increasingly globally. Who, who uses it? Physicians, healthcare professionals, patients see it, um, the patients see it in consumer um, types of apps and uh, EOBs, third parties, insurers, research organizations, st other standard setting um, connectivity types organizations um, use CPT. Uh, a little bit about the history of CPT. Um, it is over, we're going to the next slide. It is, oh, look at that. Um, it is, it's over 50 years old. It's been around for quite some time. It is provided by the American Medical Association, but run by an independent um, panel. For a long period of time, it was codes. It was produced in a book form. You know, amazingly, we still put out a quarter million literal books of this of CPT every year because there's a tremendous amount of detail associated with each of um, these codes. But over the year, the years, the process has changed um, and adopted the category 
categories of codes have um, have moved uh, back in um, back in the early 2000s. Uh, we ha- took the panel process from what used to be behind closed doors, um, people sitting around a table, you know, making their decisions in not open and transparent ways to an open panel process. And it's been open for almost 20 years now. CPT has really accelerated in terms of its um, evolution based on some of these milestone events here. EHR adoption um, back at the beginning of um, this century, the PAMA legislation, which was led to uh, quite a bit of changes in the lab section, precision medicine was impacted um, significantly as interoperability has become more important there. We've seen quite a bit of change in the code set to support that. And then of course, most recently with with COVID-19, the acceleration of digital medicine and the code set changes have really been reflective of that um, in a way that's been quite frankly, quite uh, quite helpful um, for, for that adoption. We'll talk a little bit more about that as Leslie gets into some of the details. The last thing I'll say about CPT before I turn to Leslie is, you know, why should you learn about it? And, you know, Josh did mention that my history is um, working on commercial technology companies, namely um, EHRs. And I will tell you that as somebody who um, led a substantive uh, company in the EHR space, I knew about CPT. I didn't really know all the details and what's behind the walls, if you will, in terms of how CPT is processed. And I wish I did because having had that now if I had had that knowledge um, you know back then it would have been helpful to me to better understand how these codes actually represent and reflect um, medicine so we've used CP- CPT as important for innovators because if you if there are codes that represent your innovation it's an established level of credibility because of this rigorous um, process most certainly in the area of insurance coverage and reimbursement it does represent represent about a trillion dollars of the three 3.6 spend in healthcare. That's not the only reason that CPT codes um, are important, but that is a notable one. Adoption. Uh, generally speaking, for innovations, you know, as CPT becomes something that describes your innovation, that is a helpful step to the adoption curve of um, your innovation out there. It doesn't guarantee it, of course, but it's a helpful one because it, it again, is a universal um, language. And we view it as if reimbursement is important for your business models um, for your innovation, CPT is one of those helpful steps steps along the way um, as it relates to reimbursement. So with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it to Leslie. um, And what she's going to do is to walk you through um, a bit of the details of the code set itself, the process of CPT, and some of those relationships with other important processes like FDA. Um, There were some questions I've already seen in the Q&A about like, how does this relate to DRGs and the like, and we'll make sure that we touch on some of those things. So with that, Leslie, I'm going to turn it to you you and your capable hands to walk us through more about CPT. Hey, great. Thanks, Lori. And hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, So let's go through and tell you a little bit about uh, the CPT code set itself. So uh, when we take a look at the CPT code set, it's really put into three different categories, covers folks from head to toe, truly. Um, This is the language of medicine, and we are the scribes of that language in CPT. So your three categories of codes, most of which people are interested in, your category one, these are your gold standard codes. They're contemporary, they're trusted, they're evidence-based, they're valued. Um, That is the main lexicon of CPT that is used. There's a second category, category two, which is really focused on performance measurement, uh, quality metrics, uh, areas of interest to the nation for improving health, and we have codes to help track that activity. And then there are some additional categories of codes that many of you are going to be interested in along the way are proprietary laboratory analyses for labs to identify their unique 
test within CPT. There's a code group for you, relatively new. Uh, MAAA codes in the laboratory space, and also category three, your emerging technology. So maybe you're just getting started with your new vision or innovation. You're not quite at the level of category one yet, but there's still a way for you to be recognized in this key language. And you can see some of the areas that have really been hopping in the last three or four years, telehealth, digital medicine, genomics, AI. So even though the set is 50 years old, it continues to uh, capture new terms and new terminologies. Uh, our code set coming out for 2022, we just did the count. We are just shy of 11,000 codes at this point and it keeps moving. Now, the great thing about CPT codes is that they really are a common language. So no matter who you're talking to, everybody understands. So when you think of the patient, um, they may, you know, good old Aunt Mary, all she knows is she's got a new hip and she's happy. Um, so for when she goes into and uh, her patient portal at Blue Cross Blue Shield and wants to take a look at what happened and how much am I paying in co-pays, um, she'll see a code and a description that makes sense to her. Uh, for your physicians and for payers, there's translations of those. So there's official descriptions and then what the actual code says uh, with the amount of detail and granularity that's required. The wonderful thing about it is this really helps in terms of data liquidity, interoperability across systems. Again, doesn't matter who you're talking to, you see that five digit or five space codes, everyone knows what you're talking about, which is great for visibility for new innovations. And as I said, the CPT pace of CPT growth has not slowed down at all. If anything, it's picking up. So in the last 10, 12 years or so, uh, we've added about 1,200 net new codes uh, in the last decade. And remember, this is a current set. So older technologies or older ways of conducting medicine are rolling off and even more are coming on. So it is in constant motion, uh, which is fantastic because it keeps it current. And I would say since about 2018 or so, it's really been a lot of those digital medicine uh, and AI and genomics work that's really spurring up the pace. Now, those are all very hot areas, um, and I'm sure many of you were involved in that. And we actually look to you as you move forward with your innovations to help ensure that as those innovations are coming in and we're getting these new codes and new items coming in, that we are addressing some key needs and filling some of the large gaps that Lori referred to when it comes to equity. So when we think about health equity in terms of CPT and this language of medicine, um, as we all know, equity and innovation, they really come together uh, to influence health outcomes. So you can have the best innovation, but if people can't access it, it doesn't go very far to help move the needle in terms of improving the health. Um, sometimes, you know, those health equity issues, a lot of times they're catalysts for innovative solutions and technologies. We've all seen uh, in some cases, it, it took a pandemic uh, to get quite a bit of recognition and um, increased payment and understanding of telehealth, remote care technologies. They were in a small area. Um, once that pandemic came up, they went to a not small area, uh, essentially. Um, and they've been critical to helping keep the health of the nation moving forward. So when innovations come into CBT, the key thing from an equity standpoint is not just that the technology is there, but that it's recognized in this lexicon in a way that it helps to enhance the adoption of that and bring value across the board when it comes to healthcare. So, and we're finding that in some ways, as many of us know, um, some of the health tech in, uh, inequities are still out there. Um, they haven't quite uh, disappeared yet. And we've got a couple of areas here. So things, if you think about patient portals, lots of patient portals, but if it's not necessarily put together in a way that populations can understand and use and interact with them, it's not gonna be very helpful. Uh, mobile apps, when you think about it, a recent study said there's an estimate of about 350,000 mobile applications around healthcare out there. In 2020 alone, I think a, a 90,000 new ones came on. That's about 250 a day, but only about 110 have more than 10 million downloads. So that wide use is very, very narrow. And it's important part of that wide use is making sure that the apps that are out there are put together in a way that all populations can use and benefit from them. Telehealth, 
primary example. We all saw that telehealth became large during the pandemic because that was the way to be able to continue to connect with your physicians. Um, and we're still finding that there are some di digital literacy skills or access to internet enabled digital devices to engage in video calls. So we all think audio visual is pretty simple. Well, uh, one of the things, and CMS has even recognized this now, um, looking in their proposed rule is recognizing the importance of not just telehealth, but how about audio only? How about being able to get to those populations where, you know, maybe grandma doesn't have an iPad and she can't really ask her eight-year-old grandson to come over and help her figure out how to turn the video on. All she's got is a phone. Can she connect with her provider via phone? And that's actually one of the interesting questions that they have out now in their proposed rule is looking at a little more of a permanent mechanism when all the patient has is a telephone. So as all of you as innovators are working on, you know, your new visions to come through, we're really looking for your help in helping to bridge the gap. So as you bring your innovations forward, not only that they help move medicine forward, but that they also are working to help close some of these inequity gaps that we see. And we know you're, you're up for the challenge. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the who, because these codes don't come around just by themselves. Um, certainly, there are some key uh, CPT groups. So I'll give you a little bit of a rundown of who these people are and uh, folks that you will be interacting with as you go through the process. So the first group, obviously, is a CPT editorial panel. And if I can, probably the best way for you to learn about this, a great synopsis of what's to follow is to listen to this short video. So hopefully, the sound will come through. Stand by. Leslie, I don't think we're hearing that. Yeah, it looks like the audio is not working. My apologies. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll just go to the next slide. And Fantastic. we'll talk a little bit about, uh, here we go. All right, so well, here's a rundown of the CPT editorial panel. So this is a group of individuals, um, physicians who have been nominated to this panel, who have the sole authority to create, revise, and update these codes, all the descriptions, all the guidelines for use. Um, of course, no language is, is of any use unless there's common rules for how it's to be used. Um, and they, uh, this group of 17 individuals is has responsibility for all of these different codes. Um, a quick rundown, our chair is Dr. Mark Sinovec, uh, Vice Chair, Dr. Christo Jack, Christopher Jagman, and then there's 17 individuals who represent uh, specialty societies from our House of Medicine, our House of Delegates, also individuals from Healthcare Professionals Advisory Committee. So those are individuals who are not physicians, but perhaps physical therapists, nurses, occupational therapists, psychologists, others that are involved um, in the care of patients. And then we have five designated seats occupied by a variety of individuals, folks from the payer space, um, America's Health Insurance Plans, the Blue Cross, uh, American Hospital Association. Um, CMS does have observer status uh, into the work that we do. Um, this is a very transparent meeting. It happens three times a year. One's coming up at the end of this month, as a matter of fact. And while there are 17 individuals around the table, they certainly can't get the job done by themselves. So what you'll see around uh, is a list and a, a litany of um, a large group of our advisory professionals representing all specialties, medical and surgical, as well as a number of standard subgroups that work on things like a pathology coding caucus who focuses in the lab space, our vaccine coding caucus who's been very busy with a lot of the COVID work lately, um, and a number of other work groups that come up for either special topics, uh, the latest work in evaluation and management codes. And so those subgroups are working all the time um, to focus on those areas, in addition to our advisory committee. All of this together um, comes to produce a process that is definitely evidence-based, clinically valid, 
criteria-based, deliberation-driven, and in terms of transparency, if you wanted to attend a panel meeting and see how it all works, it is possible to do that. Um, so I'll give you the short version, talk a little bit about uh, what's happened lately, as you can imagine, with those code counts going up. Uh, we've had to do a lot in terms of the, the work of the panel has increased quite a bit. So in April of this year, our Board of Trustees meeting of the AMA, uh, we did add an additional four seats to the editorial panel to help keep that going. So two will be from medical specialty societies, as you can see, making sure we've got work from private insurers, as well as at-large organizational members. Again, going back to making sure that that language is inclusive of all of the groups, including some groups that may not have traditionally participated in the CPT process. So now they will have that opportunity as well. Um, we just called for those nominations this summer. And so we look forward to working with uh, some of our new folks on the latest and greatest in CPT. So any time you hear the editorial panel, um, that is what it is referring to. It's a small set around the table and literally a cast of hundreds uh, supporting them. One of the large groups that supports them is our CPT advisors. So every time you have an innovation or view, um, certainly uh, not being able to have every specialty in those 17 chairs, uh, but we have a couple hundred uh, physicians and other advisors from all different specialties to give us input um, on all of the applications that come in, understanding how it works in that particular specialty, making sure that it makes sense that it's relevant and appropriate for those groups. Everyone gets a chance to input. Um, we go through the input process right now. So every specialty has a chance to input on every application that comes in. Makes for a really well-rounded perspective once we're ready to look and approve new codes. So your, uh, your applications will get numerous eyes uh, as they go through and all to make it better. And then the CPT Assistant Editorial Board, which most people don't think of in the panel process, but they're very important after the codes are approved and they're ready to be used because this is the group that is the official source for CPT coding guidance. So they are the link between your innovation and your coders and physicians in the industry and in the field so that they can accurately understand how your innovation and how that code is to be applied and used. Um, we have a broad representation similar to payer specialty societies. Many of them have connections to the panel process, so they're well versed with that. And that is something that makes sure that as new codes come out, um, everyone knows how to use the rules of that language. And there's a third group that we'll focus on a little bit more, and that's around uh, what is called the RUC, and that's the Specialty Society Relative Value Scale Update Committee, long term. Uh, but what you need to know about the RUC is that as the CPT editorial panel and that machinery helps to create new codes and get new codes approved, the RUC is the group that comes in after the codes have been approved and works on actual valuation. So they get into the nuts and bolts of what does it take to provide that service in either physician work, uh, practice expense, liability insurance, a number of other areas. Um, specialties are again polled when those new questions come in to say, how does this actually work? And they measure down to the, the band-aid, the piece of gauze, whatever it is, um, to make sure that there's an appropriate valuation to represent the effort required uh, to provide that service. And that is key because when we talk a little bit about the payer landscape in a minute, um, those valuations will be very important in how they play a key role in how reimbursement is set in a number of different payers. Um, so I'll probably, uh, when you think about it, um, the way this works is that you know, Medicare implemented a resource-based relative value scale in 1992, for those who weren't familiar. And it's a standardized physician payment scale where the payments for those services are determined by the resource costs to provide them. The ROC is the group that determines the resource costs. So Medicare is going to put their own multiplier on it and um, through various rooms come up with reimbursement. So you can start to see how a CPT code is your initial stop on the pathway to reimbursement. Um, until you can get that reimbursement, we have to know what your innovation is. And if you had a great innovation, but no code, gonna be hard to step on that path. So that's where the CPT gets you started. Now let's talk a little bit about the what 
and how that works. Hey, Leslie, um, can yeah. I just um, interrupt one sec? We're getting a lot of questions um, in the chat, um, in the Q and A. Thank you. Keep them coming um, okay. about the seat. So I just want to, I just want to um, underscore some of Leslie's uh, comments about the seats around the table of CPT. Um, so the key underscore is we we are expanding the panel by four seats. Some of that is due to capacity. Some of that is due to the pace of innovation. And some of that is due to direct feedback that we have received from conversations um, like in this large audience in um, discussion. So one of the questions that was in the Q&A about a technology focused um, kind of seat, we have this open seat to address just that. And we are accepting um, those applications now. So we have listened and we have um, heard and we have, are, are making changes and we appreciate um, that input. Also important to know there was a question conflict of interest um, in the chat for some of those seats. The panel members have a responsibility to use their independent judgment and not the, um, not the uh, voice of the organization that they are a part of. So that is an important part of their responsibility. We spend quite a bit of time on conflicts of interest and things of that nature. Um, those are actually called out in meetings, um, which uh, you are all welcome to attend. Those are open, open meetings. So just wanna provide that additional commentary uh, due to some of the questions. There are some other questions, quite a few that get into, you know, what is AMA doing to um, shorten the length of time of the process. Uh, Leslie's going to go through some of that in her presentation. And we'll also point out some changes as Josh re referenced in the beginning of changes that we've made, again, due to input that have materially um, changed the length of time of the process while still maintaining the important rigor that Leslie is underscoring in the presentation. Sorry, Leslie, just wanted to provide those additional comments. Oh, no problem on all. Uh, please keep them coming for our folks who are able to take a look. Uh, I will say when I'm sharing the screen, I'm not always able to see the Q&A. So please uh, chime up if we've got some key ones in there. I want to make sure we don't lose anyone. So we'll uh, move forward and talk a little bit about how the CPT and the RUC process uh, work together to um, influence and have input into the Medicare payment schedule. So it serves as a feed into that. Um, so as the CPT panel uh, approves the codes, as I indicated, uh, the RUC process kind of starts up. Um, they send out a request to all the specialties to indicate their level of interest and in survey uh, for the upcoming codes, uh, to, if they have input on what's involved in this particular service. Um, those go through and get uh, determined in terms of uh, you know, letters of interest and um, understanding um, what's required for that particular service. The valuations are made, and as I indicated, CMS uses those valuations as they determine their Medicare payment schedule. So there is a connection between all of this that happens. Now, there are some additional reimbursement mechanisms that fall outside of this. Uh, the reimbursement mechanism for PLAs, a proprietary lab uh, analyses, um, the clinical lab fee schedule, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, may not even need to go into a lot of detail on that one, um, as well as category three. And category three is a little bit of a, is a, little bit of a question mark um, because there has been a myth out there that category three codes, um, it's great to have a code, but uh, nobody gets reimbursed for them and people don't necessarily like them. Um, to those who will say that for category three, I'll say, hold that thought uh, because we're gonna come back at the end and do a little busting of that particular myth. Um, I'll reach out to my colleagues here at the AMA. Is there anything else about reimbursement mechanisms, uh, PLA or clinical lab fee schedule that we'd like to uh, tap into here or should we kind of proceed forward? Let's, let's keep going, Leslie. I think we're, okay. we're, Jay's back furiously trying to answer all the questions coming in and we've got okay. more coming, which is great. Okay, fantastic. So let's keep going. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the payer landscape as long as we're on the payment topic um, and how, why CMS is mentioned so frequently for people who may not be familiar. So three key points you need to know about CMS. First of all, they 
uh, administer the Medicare program. That's about 59 million enrollees nationwide. Um, so there is a visibility and scale there that really no one else has been able to match as a single payer. Um, they're also the single largest purchaser of personal health care. Uh, so when we're thinking of that $3 trillion spend, you're looking at the payer that controls a little over a fifth of it. Um, so that's influence in the market. And third, um, Medicare has a dual role, which is very unique. Not only are they a payer, they're also a regulator. Um, so what that means is whatever CMS does, which you will find with many other payers, while they don't have to always adopt CMS's policies, um, what CMS determines will significantly influence other payers will take a look um, at what happens there. And so as you go through and you start learning more about the, the payer mechanism, that may be why uh, you hear CMS mentioned so frequently, because they're not the only payer in town, but they are a significant one. So, and the good thing about CPT codes is even if you're in an innovation where it's not in a payer space, uh, perhaps you're in something where it's more, you know, consumer driven healthcare, a cash pay model, so it goes outside of the payer space, CPT codes are beneficial to all of those different areas as well. Again, that common language can move through um, regardless of how your innovation is reimbursed. It is still, again, a language everybody understands. Now, when it comes to diagnostics, um, the CPT has taken a particular focus on digital health. That's one of the big hot areas. And we actually have one of those advisory groups that we talked about in that circle um, is the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group, or DIMPAG. And their charge is really to look at um, focusing on those four questions that Lori had noted when it comes to digital technologies um, and advancement areas. Does it work? Taking a look at the innovation and regulation space, will I get paid? Uh, will I be liable? Um, with new technology, always a question. And will it work in my practice? So when you think about what a physician goes through in evaluating a new technology, those are the four questions that's gonna be in their minds. And this is a group with all of the new innovations. Their focus is taking a look at some of those um, and understanding not only what's coming in in terms of uh, maybe promising applications, but also making sure that the CPT code set is keeping up with the advancement. So are there gaps? Are there different things that we need to understand? This is the group that focuses on all of those. Um, and their goal is really for um, things like remote physiologic monitoring codes, internet consultation codes, um, helping to get broader coverage of those services with payers like CMS and helping to raise awareness, um, and then helping to create some use cases and evidence uh, to underscore the importance of this segment um, as the industry grows and continues to evolve. And they've had some key focus areas, um, a coding and payment um, for people looking for 2022. One of the new things you will actually see this year um, is to help create the first time to see a digital taxonomy in coding for digital health that's within CPT. So moving that forward, a lot in artificial intelligence. We've had a couple of uh, really great codes and new codes set up in the last couple of years. We'll go through a few of those results fairly soon. And then also advocacy, um, as we've indicated. So they have some certain focus areas that they work on, um, but they've been uh, really key in keeping these front and center and making sure that CPT stays front and center with them. Um, a couple of, and I want to just really quickly go through a few results. Don't worry, you don't have to read all the slides. Uh, you will have those later. But over the last couple of years, thanks for remote physiologic monitoring. Now there's remote therapeutic monitoring um, of conditions and, and items not currently covered by existing CPT codes. Um, pulmonary artery pressure sensor remote monitoring. So a lot of the work in the remote space there's different types of things you have to evaluate when you're looking at this type of innovation. And they've been very helpful in calling these out. Um, online digital evaluation services and e-visits. Um, medicine is moving beyond bricks and mortar. So we need to make sure that we're keeping up with it. So all of these have come on in the last couple of years. More exciting things have really come in in terms of things to help in terms of patients, how, how care is being provided for patients, and how they're putting in a new information themselves, like self-measured self blood pressure monitoring. How many folks have gone to a physician's office, got that white coat hypertension, can't get a good reading, but if they're home for a couple weeks and they take measurements over time, 
sometimes that's a better indicator of where the patient really is. So we're recognizing that and the work that the physicians and others do once that information comes back in to work with the patient. Really exciting, um, remote retinal imaging, one of our first automated AI uh, codes has come through that came through last year, I believe. And uh, more coming in a lot in the ophthalmology space optical coherence tomography, and again, the digital taxonomy we've noted. So uh, continues to move forward and uh, shows no signs of slowing down with that. Now, in addition to the specific codes here, a couple other areas, ways CPT helps to foster innovation. Um, as I indicated, our proprietary laboratory analysis space, um, it is specific for labs and manufacturers to uniquely identify their laboratory tests. Um, there are some criteria, it is not as strong as other category ones, and it's really focused on this group, uh, the test to be available in the US on human specimens, and uh, the clinical lab or manufacturer that offers the test must request the code. Um, so it's a way for you to come into the space uh, and, get the, and get your recognition. Uh, we've had over 150 codes come in in the last five or six years, and these are, codes are updated four times per year. Now that's important because category one codes um, those large gold standard codes are really only approved and go into process once per year. We meet three times a year, but the new codes become active one times a year. This one, because of the pace of innovation, moves that much faster. So um, in terms of how long it takes, if you put in an application for a code, if it's approved to have it come through, does not take a year. It's, made, it's a matter of months. Uh, category three codes are fueling a Leslie, wide- Leslie, I'm just, yes. just going to um, interject Questions? for one second. Mm -hmm. There was a question in the Q&A on PLA codes in terms of like, what is the process? We, we do have an online process for how you submit for a code change application. Um, mm -hmm. And we have an online process for a PLA code. Leslie's going to cover it very briefly, but um, at, later on, but there is, um, there's an online mechanism for how you go about that. And if if there are questions about it, just shoot in the chat and we'll provide the links. Fantastic. Okay. Um, and then additional areas of innovation, what CPT helps with is category three codes. Um, and this goes beyond laboratories, obviously. This is for uh, new and emerging technology, procedures, services. Um, so a number of your different technical innovations you'll find here. Uh, I would suspect that many on this audience, um, if you're looking at submitting an application, it wouldn't be surprised if it showed up as a category three code. The idea is this is created primarily for data collection, um, assessment of services and procedures. So if it's very new in the market, you may be thinking, how do I just get it out there? How do I know that people are starting to utilize this? I'm working my way up to the standards of a category one code. This is the way to begin that recognition. Um, it is one of our most visible areas of change. The codes are, have a shelf life typically of about five years, um, but it is possible and many do decide to continue some of those as their evolution, as their uh, vision evolves. But this is one of the fastest growing areas of the code set. Um, we've seen an increase of almost threefold uh, since these came on in 2011. And it is definitely um, evolving and moving quite a bit with some very new and neat technologies. Um, other ways that CPT has helped to embrace innovation, uh, certainly we have not been immune to the impacts of uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, certainly with many of our codes, we were all expecting, particularly when it came to telemedicine. And for those who haven't been in the industry for a while, for a long time, telemedicine was used uh, with specific restrictions, geographic restrictions. So not everyone really had to engage in it unless you were in a remote area or seeing patients from that area. And the expectation was that we knew telemedicine was coming, but that it would come in a very orderly fashion, um, nice and neatly rolled out. And basically what really happened is everybody got strapped onto the back of a rocket and launched out into the telemedicine space over probably about a week <laughs> as, the, as the entire nation kind of went into quarantine. We saw a perfect example of this in um, one of the queries we get for requesting coding information and guidance. And we got a message, I will say the day um, the AMA went into quarantine from a member physician who was uh, pretty much in a panic state, under, trying to understand how do I use these codes? What do I use here? What do I use there? And at the end of a very long diatribe, she said, I'm just trying to take care of my patients. Now, the good thing 
was that all of her questions about what codes do I use? How can I respond to this? With CPT, we were able to answer all of those questions. There's about a dozen of them in there. Um, but there were solutions for everything she needed within CPT. And it continues to evolve most definitely with COVID. Um, uh, the CPT editorial panel, I said it meets three times a year. Well, last year in 2020 and through 2021, uh, we kicked that process into overdrive rather than having the panel meet three times a year, that panel met monthly. And the result that we've had um, is that we now have about 43 new COVID related CPT codes uh, since that time, focusing on things, everything from testing, uh, protective personal equipment supply codes, all the way up through vaccines and vaccine administration, and it's still growing. So if people wonder that the process is too old and too stiff, can't flex, not true. Um, I'm going to stop there before we get to the when and the how and see if we have any more uh, questions from the Q&A or chat that we want to try to address right now. Lori, how are we doing? Yeah, I think we're doing great. And I think, Leslie, as we get to some of the um, length of time of process that intersect with FDA, there's definitely questions about that. There's questions about some of the criteria specifically, um, which, which are part of the panel process. Um, so let's maybe move to that. But Jay and Kenyatta are, are doing a fantastic job staying on top of things. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's go on. And actually, um, I couldn't ask for a better segue because now we're going to talk about the when and the how. So innovation life cycles, the CPT process, um, and how you as innovators can interact with the system. And no better place to start um, than start talking about the processes. You may not be familiar with CPT, but most of you are probably very familiar with the FDA and your own device development life cycle. So just wanted to lay out um, a couple of items, um, not necessarily the deepest dive in the world. We don't have time for all of that, but a few observations that may be helpful as you start thinking about your own development timeline. So previously, you know, we thought of development cycles taking three years, seven years in some industries. Certainly today, it's much less. And what I would probably recommend uh, when you take a look at your FDA processes. So think about when you're in the initiation, the opportunity stage, um, you're thinking very, very early risk assessment on the FDA, right? And as you move through your design process, you get to thinking about from a various early assessment to what's my strategy? What's my early strategy? Then once your formulation and concept is complete and you're in design, you recheck that strategy. Is that really where we want to go? And if so, let me start getting my submission together. And you start your studies and getting all of your background information together um, to the point where uh, hopefully once you're ready that your, your product's final and it's ready for the market, that you've gotten your regulatory clearance at about the same time. Always great when that, uh, when that ties up. And then you've got your product launch, post-launch assessments, et cetera. Now, in terms of CPT, um, when you really think about it, what most people don't think about, they may not think about CPT until it's much later in the process. And probably the one um, point to consider is to think about considering CPT requirements throughout your development process. Um, one of the things I do when I'm not uh, in front of this computer screen is flying airplanes. And if anybody out there is a pilot, you know, there are a few, two things that are probably of less use to you than anything else. And one is fuel that you left in the tanks at the fuel farm and runway that is behind you. So the idea is to think about early in the process, even before you're sure exactly what you need, think about some of your initial requirements. And we'll get to a couple of slides where these are coming through because there are some parallels between the CPT and the FDA process to keep uh, things on a, on a quick pace, think early. Who wants to redo a phase three study? No, nobody I know. Um, so there are a couple areas that are some, uh, that are some, uh, there are some parallels there. And I did just see actually a comment from Josh. Thank you about that. Um, so we're going to do a quick walkthrough of some of the key application process steps in a CPT code change application process. And in our resources, we've got all of the deep details that you need, but we're going to give you some of the high five phases that you're going to walk through as you go through here. So first, um, applications are submitted. Uh, pretty much all of these application submissions, as Lori indicated, they're all online now. Um, you can actually submit any time of year. 
Uh, but three times a year, we will sort of wrap those up. Uh, generally, they're due about 12 weeks before a panel meeting. Um, once your application is in, it's going to be reviewed by our editorial panel members and our advisors, um, as well as our AMA staff. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Then there's a comment period where after it's reviewed. Um, and as applicants, I believe you actually get to see what those comments are. And based on them, you might decide you want to make a tweak or two uh, to your application. At that point, it's fine. Um, and then until it's presented at a panel meeting, um, you have the option to modify or if you say, hmm, might need to think about some things a little bit more, there is a process where you can actually withdraw that and keep working on it if you need to. And then we'll talk about what happens at the panel uh, meeting itself, um, including either acceptance or non-acceptance or some of the other outcomes that you'll see. So in terms of the code change application itself, again, this is used to request not only new codes, uh, but revisions, deletions, modifications to existing nomenclature, and they can originate from anywhere. Uh, most here, it will be many of you from technology and manufacturers, but um, applications can are, are pretty open process in terms of who can submit an application. Now, in terms of our key components, um, there are some for particularly our category one, remember that's gold standard, evidence-based, ready to roll, category three, emerging technologies, you're on the path, you want to get recognized. Um, here are some of the key items that will start. you'll start to think about um, in terms of what's going to be needed for that application. So certainly I won't go through them all. Um, you see FDA status there. Basically, if your uh, innovation or code is something that requires FDA approval, um, you do need to have FDA approval prior to submitting, particularly for category one. Um, there's a number of other items you'll fill in. What's the description of your code? Why do you think it's here? Information on studies and literature. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, who typically provides the service? digital options are now included in that application. So um, AI folks, take note. Uh, any known guidelines, a description of the service, how does it work? Um, what does a physician do? That's a key piece of it. Um, so there's a number of elements that we're going to ask you for. And if you take a look at that list, um, you may see some things are somewhat similar to what you might have to answer for your FDA approval as well. Step two. Uh, your application will then go to the CPT editorial panel. Um, again, they use objective criteria. We're going to have some summaries of those on the next couple of slides. Um, and each panel member will review those application, the notes. Um, based on that review, they use their clinical judgment um, in assessing that review. And some of the criteria that you're going to see, um, okay, and what you've got is uh, for category one and three, there are some standard uh, general criteria that you'll go through, and these are summarized, uh, but things to think about. Make sure that the service you're defining, that it's unique and it's well-defined. Making sure that it's a unique service within uh, CPT is important. Um, that it's clearly identified, distinguished from existing codes and services. So it's a little research you'll need to do uh, to make sure that you've really carved out a distinct niche uh, with your particular innovation. That it's uh, consistent with editorial panel standards, um, that it's not a fragment or sub-segment of some other code, again, needs to really be unique, uh, that your description accurately reflects the service, that it is a, um, it's not being used as a way to report those extraordinary far end of the bell curve sort of services, um, but this really describes what is the typical circumstances related to the performance of that service, and that it satisfies the category-specific uh, criteria as well. So a couple of things there. Um, from here, your criteria will change depending on whether or not you're going for a category one code or category three. And your category one code criteria um, are going to be a little bit stricter than category three, understandably so. So again, if it requires FDA clearance that you've got it, um, that it's performed by physicians or other qualified healthcare professionals looking at a broader scale across the United States. So we're thinking about how widespread is this in use, um, performed with a frequency consistent with what we would intend for a clinical use. So if it's a procedure or a process that's used on a very, very small subset of patients, um, we would not expect um, a wide frequency of use, say, with uh, something for, say, knee replacements. So it varies depending on what it is that's being proposed. 
It's consistent with, clinic, with current medical practice and the clinical efficacy is documented in literature. So you do have literature requirements as well. Now, category threes are different sets of criteria. Again, these are emerging technologies. So you may not meet all of those standards for level one, but for here, you would have a criteria that it's currently or recently performed in humans. So there is still an evidence and rigor base, but not as strong as the category ones. Um, we also need to see that it's supported by uh, at least one or CPT or an advisor representing practitioners uh, of the service and that there's some information on actual or potential clinical efficacy um, in the literature and evidence of evolving clinical utilization. So recognizing this is on the path, um, but it's, it's at a slightly different stage. So the criteria are a little bit different. And again, these are all abbreviations. And at the end, we'll have a resource where you can read all the fine print um, about those criteria, but that's a subset of what's there. Next step in the process is really three and four. So you've sent your application, you feel you meet the criteria, you send it in, um, and that's when your application is gonna be reviewed by AMA staff. Um, we'll also send it out to our advisory panel and they'll give input and feedback. Um, at that point, we probably post an agenda about 30 days in advance to indicate what specifically is going to be discussed at that meeting. So again, a very open process. It's on our AMA website. Uh, you can hop in and see it. And until that application is presented on the floor, again, based on what you see back from those feedback and the criteria, you may decide you want to do a little fine tuning. You may decide you want to hold until the next panel meeting and maybe come back with something. So you do have an opportunity, if need be, uh, to make some adjustments, either refinements or um, go back and sharpen your pencil a little bit then step back in. But once you're at the panel meeting, um, you will be attending as an applicant uh, and answering questions from the panel and reviewers. They're a very friendly group. Um, you also get an opportunity for input from the general audience, input from advisors, um, and then panel members will vote on the application. It is an anonymous vote. Uh, you find out after the meeting, um, a little ways after the meeting, whether or not the uh, item was accepted or rejected. Um, depending on how the conversation goes, you may find a need for a little bit of a timeout even during the panel meeting, it's a couple of days, and there is an opportunity to either uh, either postpone that conversation until the next meeting if it takes a little more fine tuning, or to table it, go off and have a small conversation and come back sometime during the meeting. So there's a number of different options and, and outcomes that you'll find. And then based on that, then you'll get, um, if you go through with the process and it's voted, uh, then there will certainly be uh, you know, an opportunity, you'll, you'll hear back from the panel with official a notification of the outcome of your particular application. Now I'm going to stop for CAP 3 for just a moment um, and talk a little bit about its experience over time because as we all know category threes there they generally have a shelf life of five years and the applicant has an option of whether or not they want to extend that time. Um, so first of all when we take we did a little bit of analysis uh, a while back and of the category three applications that came in over uh, a 10 or 11 year period, um, about 80, uh, 87, 88% of them were actually approved um, on first time. So if people are saying they never get approved, eh, not necessarily true, uh, most of them are. And we took a look at some of those codes and we looked out from those five years and said, what happened to those codes five years out? Um, and a good portion, about a third actually converted uh, to category one. So when you feel that you're ready, uh, for category one, you've got that evidence use, you've got that widespread use, you've got that utility, whatever it is you needed to, to capture with that tracking data, you have it. Um, about a third will go on and become our gold standard codes. Um, some of them will remain category three, perhaps the uh, cap data capture period needs to be a little bit longer, so you do have the option to do that. Um, and about a third, uh, a little under a third, where the code is simply subset. And again, for emerging technologies, uh, that's probably pretty par for the course. Um, it's not a, no, no, no technology is an automatic slam dunk. And so sometimes things need to go to other areas. And that's all, um, that's all up to, uh, the, that's uh, with the applicant and the panel process. Um, that's not surprising that that happens. Now, uh, a couple of things in terms of areas for application improvement. Um, certainly this is not seen as um, making a, 
uh, uh, sending up a you know particular uh, consulting. Everybody's at a different stage, um, but a couple of things we did take a look for category threes um, that maybe didn't quite make uh, standards or um, were rejected for some reason. And we asked ourselves why was that. Um, because there's such a varied category that comes through. Um, and one of the things that we commonly see uh, with a lot of Category 3 uh, applications that are rejected is doing a little bit of that background. So again, making sure that an existing CPT code doesn't already address some or part of your service procedure. Having that unique area um, is very important. So this is the long version of the criteria, uh, basically making sure that it's not a fragmentation something that's already out there, or uh, currently reportable as a complete service by one or more existing codes. Um, so it's really unique. Um, and it's important to think about that because as you consider your own coding pathway, one of the benefits of CPT is that codes are unique. Um, every situation has a particular coding solution. And you want to uh, think about in terms of importance to your coding pathway, um, from category three to category one. I know we don't have a whole lot of time uh, left on this one, but a particular note uh, to take a look at a particular company that um, wanted to try to uh, jump the gun, as it were, and had a technology that um, could have been used with the category three code. Um, they opted instead to find a rarely used category one code and uh, give advice that that was the code to be used for their technology. Well, the technology takes off um, the utilization of that code goes up. And what that did was it uh, put a little bit of a spotlight um, on our resource utilization group, our RUC committee to say, hmm, we're seeing a lot more activity in this category one code. What's going on? Uh, is there some new, no, new way that things are being used? Is it still the same procedure? Because we couldn't quite explain the difference in the highlight and variance. Um, and they took a lot and the code was evaluated because the code was a category one code, that resource group took a look at that code based on category one criteria. The technology this group was wanting to use was still at the category three stage. So what happened is that innovation was carved out now into a separate category three code um, because for the reasons that we indicated here, it was a lack of volume and um, clinical efficacy was a little bit of a concern. But what it would mean for that particular company is now there's confusion in the market because again, physicians, everyone sees that five digit code, they know what it means. They said, well, it used to be that, now it's something else. What's happened? And it's really confusion that didn't really need to happen. So the moral of that particular story is there is a resource that we have at the AMA, it's called the CPT Network. And it can be one of a number of tools in your toolkit um, to help get official coding guidance on whether or not your particular service or procedure is somehow covered um, or addressed within another code. Now that does not supplant the panel process by any means, but in case you're wondering or you're trying to do your research and you're not quite sure, uh, there may be someone who can give a little additional insight, uh, not official uh, sanction of course, but they can say, now it looks like it's this, or because it's quite possible, we may have gotten a similar question before. And so there are ways to uh, get some information there. Now, in terms of the FDA process, I did note at the beginning um, that there are some parallels with the CPT uh, code change application process. Again, small text, but um, just a quick summary. If you're looking at a 510K submission, um, obviously there's certain categories of information here that the FDA is going to be looking for. When you overlay the CPT process um, on the right-hand side, you can see a number of those different categories have perhaps not exact, um, because we know that processes for approval of codes for care and then approval for FDA are just a little bit different. Uh, but there are a, lot, a number of parallels, which is why uh, we have the education to take a look at the two processes, because you might find information that's common uh, across both of them and things you can think about um, as you're thinking about how to speed up your process. So if you're looking at that on the FDA side, um, is there something similar that you might be asked about when you get to the CPT process? So just think about ahead with that. PMA submissions, same thing. Um, obviously a lot more detailed when you come to PMAs. There's a very stylized view of it. 
But when you overlay uh, the CPT code change application process, again, you're going to see a lot of parallels for similar types of information. Um, so it may be in your interest to start thinking uh, a little bit early about some of those categories because you may come around to something very similar to that again. Um, now, when it comes to the code change application process, we have done quite a bit um, at the AMA to make sure that the CPT process is uh, uh, is enhanced and makes it easier for all of you as innovators to interact with the process. So two key items I'd want to point out here. Uh, one is in the terms of literature standards. Um, we uh, do assist applicants with the code application process. Um, and a couple of things just noted here, uh, clarifying the impact and use of literature on the outcome of CPT editorial panel considerations. Um, we've also increased the focus on identifying and documenting papers that have overlying authors or patient populations, just to make it a little more streamlined for our reviewers to actually go through the information as well. Um, one of the key items that has changed recently, uh, there used to be a literature requirement that um, a certain number of studies needed to involve a US population, um, and that that requirement has now changed, um, and that literature submitted no longer requires a US patient population, so something to keep in mind there. And um, it also helps applicants to better select the most appropriate level of evidence for the story that you want to present. Um, in terms of open collaboration, uh, that's the other part that's really been enhanced in terms of the CPT process, and I'll probably focus on what's called the interested party process. Um, so this is really a way for anyone to review and comment on code change submissions. Now, I don't believe that they get the full view of all of the information that comes through, but they can, it can be helpful if there is an application that is going through that may be in your area and you say, hmm, I may not be ready to submit myself, but I'd be curious in what goes on with this particular application or be able to keep track of it. Um, and so stakeholders that are not represented by advisors can review and comment on those agenda items um, before the coming before the panel um, within certain deadlines. Um, and it also allows for verbal comments to be provided in person. Um, at any CPT editorial panel meeting where that's being discussed. Um, obviously, uh, there's conflict of interest statements and all sorts of legalese to go through with that, but it's not uh, particularly oppressive. And um, interested party requests are processed within five days of receipt. So if you want to be registered as an interested party on a particular agenda item, there's a way for you to gain some visibility um, into that process, which may be very educational, uh, particularly if you're just learning about the process itself. So I'll start. Um, I'll stop here with the current annual code release and schedule. Um, again, there's different categories of CPT codes. They're updated on different schedules. Um, probably, I would say the best way of looking at this particular scale um, is that the faster the innovation, the more frequently those codes are. Uh, approved and go into, into play. So category one and two, again, they're released at the end of August. So we just released our set for 2022. That'll be coming out pretty soon. Those codes will go into effective January 1. They come in once a year. Um, vaccines in category threes, twice a year. Um, uh, path tier two are MAAAs um, in many of our lab areas. That's three, and then proprietary laboratory analysis is four times a year. So the process continues, but it goes at a different pace, recognizing the pace and innovation of uh, what's coming in in terms of applications. Um, I guess, uh, Lori, I don't know if we want to take this next section uh, together, or if we have questions before we get to debunking yeah, and Q&A. Uh, yeah, I'm going to um, just uh, underscore a couple of points that Leslie, you made because of some of the questions coming through in the Q and A. Um, so there's the um, you talked about some of the process changes, um, interested party, literature requirements. Um, and things uh, of that nature, which some of those changes were made to help, again, make the process very transparent. Also look to address input that we've received from the innovation audience that hopefully will shorten, not reduce rigor, but shorten the life cycle. There are uh, comments in the questions um, about the length of time to get a CPT code um, and uh, there are uh, strong questions, you know, in terms of how long it takes. Some of these changes are in direct response to 
input conversation with the innovators audience to again, ensure that we have um, a rigorous process, but that we're looking to reduce that time so that innovation can be advanced in healthcare. Some of this also comes from um, a lot of work that we've done to automate, modernize, make online, provide education, provide transparency with training um, and the like on our website about CPT so that you can know as much as possible at the beginning of the process and not, um, and not uh, learn when you're well into it. Again, to reduce cycle time and obvious expense of what it takes to keep your companies, organizations going. We have other things in front of us that we don't have, um, we don't, we haven't solved, conundrum. So what does widespread use mean is one that we have heard from this audience. There's a desire from some innovators to have a very objective, We what is the right number? We do not have an answer for that, but that has been a conversation that we've had and we're looking at data to see if there are things we can do to further inform that, um, to see if there's opportunity for change in the process, but we don't have a, a change um, uh, yet. So that's an area I just want to address, but I want to acknowledge that these are the, the kinds of things that we hear. And when we hear them, we try to dig in further because also what we hear from um, physicians, what we hear from the panel is sometimes those questions um, come in and they uh, they, they might be looking to not um, provide all the information. There are other questions that might come with us, come, come with that. And we have teased them out through conversations um, like this. So I think there are a couple um, of the debunking questions that would be quite helpful. Leslie, if you could cover, and then I think we should just go to open Q&A. We're doing, um, you're getting through quite a lot of content here, which we appreciate. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, real quick before we get to Q&A, just a few uh, myths that are, uh, we'd love to debunk at this point. So you can see on the left um, and many that we've probably heard here or, or are generating a lot of the questions. Um, the myth uh, that this middle process takes forever to complete, um, can't quite get it done. The new code change application tool uh, reduces uh, many of the administrative issues with paper-based forms. Trying to get this information together is tough enough but then when you're trying to manage paper and get that submitted, it's it's really a, it really takes it to a new level. So we've taken that all to an electronic submission form now. Um, on a lack of transparency of a myth, uh, again, these CPT editorial panel meetings are now open. Uh, the agendas are posted. Um, the instructions and criteria are all available, you know, on our website to uh, minimize that uh, churning or finding out halfway through that you've missed a key step and have to go back. Um, so we make sure that that's there. Um, help for new submitters. Um, there's a lot for um, our, our AMA CPT staff, again, with the online resources to help you through these steps um, as you proceed. Uh, the complexity working against the, uh, the applicants, again, our open panel process. Panel has been an open process since 2005, um, and we've done a lot to really sort of streamline it so um, it's as, as well easily understood and, and known as it can be. And the last one I'd probably want to uh, just put a pin in is the idea that those category three codes, um, that they simply do not get reimbursed, what's the point? And uh, the reality is that um, in 2019, um, the codes can get uh, actually can be reimbursed. It's a little more of an individual payer basis. So it's not uh, as smooth a road as a category one, but in 2019, those category three codes uh, for CMS for Part B services got not paid uh, to the tune of $212 million. So um, I don't, it's, it's not that they, um, that they are all, the fact that they, people say that if people say they're always not reimbursed, uh, not quite true. Um, so uh, with that, um, I think I'd probably just open it up to uh, Q&A and Josh and Andrew and uh, the whole team for the time we have left. Thank you, Leslie. That was awesome. Really, really good job. And you landed precisely at 2.30. I'm <laughs> impressed. <laughs> that was a lot of material and you really handled it so well. And also, uh, Lori as well. Thank you. Um, and Jay, uh, you're a fast typer, man. <laughs> So if you haven't, I'm sure people have been watching the Q&A go by and it's been amazing. And 
uh, the team that's been answering has really been on top of it. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of good content there. Uh, so I definitely refer people to the Q&A. Just scan down there. Your questions may, may be there. We're going to elevate a few for discussion here. And, uh, and no, Lori, the zingers are not from me. <laughs> I was not doing that. <laughs> this is sure. Sure. No, it's true. It's true. Uh, you know, the, these are, you know, we, we, as you can tell, we've talked a little bit about some of these um, offline before we got here and, uh, and we will continue to. And what I will say, just to reinforce, you know, as I, and you could obviously from the questions, there are a lot of, there's a lot of frustrations. Um, but you know what? What's what's good to know for all the innovators, and you know we have uh, we've had at times three hundred uh, over three hundred listening today. Is that you know the the AMA is really on our side. You know, there's no reason why they want to create a barrier to you to getting your products to to uh, patients. Um, it's a process though, um, and so all processes have certain steps, and so we are talking actively about how to make those steps. Um, just a little bit uh, faster, a little bit more easier to navigate and clear and in its process. That is a process as well. But I will say that the team here has been tremendously responsive and, you know, we've made amazing progress um, and hopefully more to come. Uh, to that end, I'll ask the uh, first question, uh, which is, you know, what, what specifically is being done to decrease the time from, you know, um, innovation to clinical integration, Lori? Yeah, so, so a lot of the processes, you know, the changes that you've already seen that, you know, in terms of changing the CPT process, interested parties, literature requirements are definitely some of those, but then also education like this. I mean, one of the things, you know, Leslie was mentioning just as an example, the online um, education that we provide for the code change application. We are literally watching, like, where do people trail off um, from uh, trail off in terms of the application process to see if there's education that we need to do. We've actually reached out to applicants where they've trailed off from submitting an application to see if they um, need help. So that's one mechanism with CPT. Um, and then we as an AMA are, are very committed to doing education and having conversations with the innovation audience. You're absolutely right, Josh. We are committed as an AMA. We want more innovation um, in healthcare for all the purposes that innovators do. Do, providing better outcomes, reducing costs overall, better patient experience, addressing some of the large problems um, in healthcare. So those, those are the things. And some of these issues are complex. So we don't have the ready-made, this is the answer that you want. We can just give it. So, but we are open to the conversations. I don't believe we've shut down any of them, um, even if they're difficult to um, sort as to how to navigate what is the, um, the, uh, an improved answer. Thank you. Andrew, you want to take the next one? Yeah, I think this one is, again, for you, Leslie, it's just a, just a definition. I think there was an audio issue um, when we were talking about the Cat 3s. Um, we were talking about sunsetting. Could you just further define sunsetting? Sure. Um, with the Category 3 code, when a Category 3 code is approved, um, it has sort of a built-in shelf life, if you will, uh, of five years. And the idea behind that is that if your innovation is um, on the path and you're starting to get it recognized, that it gives you that amount of time um, for you to gain information on that utility, the usage. And so it's able to stay in that category for about five years. When that is decided to, uh, when that five years is beginning to get to its end, um, then the applicant has an option. If they want to continue uh, for that to stay on as a category three code, they can apply for that to be extended. Or if not, it is what we call we sunset that code. So the code is retired and uh, we leave information for those coders. It's like, you know, this code has been sunset and in the meantime, you use, you know, whatever code it is. Usually it's probably something on the line of an unlisted code, but that's what the sunset means. The category threes have a uh, a built-in shelf life unless the applicant opts to extend it. Yeah, and it's not just, uh, you know, it can be, it, so we might not even hear from an applicant on a category three code, but somebody like a medical specialty will say, hey, look, we're still using this thing. Um, we, we, we feel that it should be continued, even if it, even if it has low utilization. So 
um, just one specialty or one individual that isn't even the applicant raising their hand to say, yeah, we think this should be continued and here's why uh, that category three code can continue. Great, thank Thanks. you. Um, next question is, what's the relationship between uh, CPT codes and other codes like ICD-9s, DRGs, et cetera? Did I type ICD-9, by the way? Was that me? <laughs> no, <laughs> ICD-10 now. No, no. <laughs> ICD-10, ICD-10, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my um PSD. <laughs> uh, well if you like I, I i'll take a first swing at that and certainly ask my colleagues to join in um i'm i'm i'm, I'm an old coding geek so um it's funny you say icd9 I, I originally learned on icd9 so i won't say how old i am but that gives you an idea so um in terms of uh, cpt and icd icd codes um, as they're used here in the states icd10 cm um, is what you call a diagnosis code. So that basically says, why is this patient here today? What's wrong? Okay, well, we all, we're all running hospitals and clinics. We're not running hotels. You have to be here for at least one reason. So those, uh, those diagnosis codes will tell you, why are you here? CPT code will say, what is the service that we're providing you today? So um, is it, you know, is it a follow up on that surgery? Is it checking out that sore throat and whatever it is? So ICD-10 CM, the diagnosis code say what was done? CPT, I mean, diagnosis code say what's wrong? CPT code say what's being done? Typically, those two are going to be used together on any medical claim. Um, so when you go to a payer, you're going to have at least those two codes that's being used. Uh, there's additional one that's been used in the inpatient side, we won't really get into that right now. Um, but those two can sometimes, oftentimes they'll work in uh, parallel when, say, if you hear about, say, prior authorization with payers, um, a lot of times they'll try to take a look and say, well, should certain codes be used with certain uh, diagnoses? We don't advocate that. We leave that to the physician to determine what service is most appropriate for the patient. Um, but you will typically see those two used together when it comes to insurance claims. Um, one of the areas that, but they can sometimes help to augment one another. Um, and I'd probably say with our latest revision of evaluation and management codes, your standard office visit codes when you go to visit your doc. It's a very small set, but it's about a fourth of that Part B spend um, and CMS is in these 10 or 11 little codes. And we've recently revised those guidelines in 2021. And one of the changes that we made um, in an area of what's called medical decision making, won't get into it in a lot of detail, but um, for the first time, we've actually recognized that certain social determinants of health can have an impact in terms of what it is that physician or other health provider really needs to do to help work and treat with that patient. And so while the codes are not necessarily listed there, the concept is in evaluation and management. Now, the benefit of that is that when you look on the diagnosis code side, there are codes that talk about social determinants of health. And again, we don't mandate that certain codes be used, but it will start to at least put the two terms side by side to think about if I can help get credit, as it were, uh, for a more complex visit because I have a patient who uh, does not have a set home, and so it's difficult for them to, uh, you know, adhere to follow-up instructions. And what do we have to do to make sure that patient gets the best care? It may trigger some to say, "Hmm, how do we how do we report that? How do we record that?" So when we send it to the insurance company, they know that we had to do a little bit more than we normally would have done. So it's starting to bring some of those things to light. Um, I'm trying to think anything else that I've uh, missed on those two code sets or. I know, uh, Andrew, uh, Josh, was there a question around DRGs as well, or yes. was it just- How did you, where, did, where did DRGs fit into all that? Yeah. Ah, okay. All right, so DRGs, Diagnosis Related Group. Uh, you'll typically find this on the inpatient side. Um, it's a way of categorizing the care that's provided generally on an inpatient basis into various buckets um, listed by, by body system, essentially. Um, but it's a way that your inpatient facilities are going to get paid. So those ICD-10 CM diagnosis codes, they're still used on the inpatient side. Rules are a little different, but that group is still there. Um, CPT is used to identify the physician work uh, that's being done. So the work of your surgeon, the work of your consultating physicians when you're um, sitting in that bed in that very 
unflattering, you know, uh, gown and, and, and somebody's coming in to talk to you and even though, you know, hopefully you know who they are and they're talking well to you. But um, for many of those services, the physician services are still represented by CPT codes. Um, the hospital uses a different nomenclature to represent this, the services that they utilize in taking care of you. So things like the cost of the operating room and all that kind of stuff, it's a different set. Um, but you'll see CPT and ICD-10 used in both ways. Um, many of the DRGs are driven by what is the primary problem? What's the reason that you're there? So diagnosis codes drive a lot of it. Um, and that determines primarily, again, how usually for payment, how an inpatient facility is gonna get paid uh, for each inpatient stay. Great, thank you. So I've got another one for Leslie. Sorry, it looks like it's the, the Leslie show at the moment. <laughs> so at, at one point during, you, you noted that a, a seldom used code took off because it was being used by a new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, once that was discovered, it was relegated to a CAT, CAT 3 uh, because of low volume. Yet it didn't appear to make sense because high utilization was what was needed to justify the CAT 1 code in the first place. Is there a, did, yeah. Did uh, uh, no, you didn't. Um, but I'm glad you brought it up because uh, I want to put a little more context around that story. I probably, uh, you know, moved a little too fast over that one. So in that situation, what will happen is, um, the, you know, the vendor had a particular technology and they were giving sort of independent advice to clinicians to say, hey, you can use our new technology with this existing code. Uh, the difficulty they had was the code that they told physicians could be used, it could be used with, didn't quite match their particular process and procedure for their new technology. So here's the type of thing that can happen. That code may not have been used very often, um, but once that technology starts taking off, the advice that was given there that may not have necessarily been what would have been recommended had they gone through a, uh, a more full process, um, but people start using the code Utilization goes up and what happens and when utilization of a code starts increasing at that speed and trajectory, um, that may start to get a little bit of information again from folk resource utilization saying, you know, this code has been pretty stable for a while or it hasn't been used very much. Now it's really taking off. Is there something different in how um, that procedure that is represented by the category one code as it was approved? Is there something about that that's changing? Something we need to know about? So it starts an investigation. And in some of that review, uh, it's quite possible that it goes through, they start you know, understanding and surveying specialties, say, hey, tell us about this code. You know, what is it that you're, are you doing something different? And in that investigation, they find that maybe there's a bifurcation of processes that are going on under one code. So some people are using it the way the code was designed to be used. But now you're starting to get a variety of people saying, well, this is the procedure that we're doing and we're using this code for it. Well, now you can start to see this procedure over here isn't quite matching the way the code was originally designed. And that's the innovation that gets now gets carved out because people look and say, well, um, I'm not quite sure, you know, what this particular innovation is, but it doesn't match the description of the procedure as was originally defined. And so that's the piece. Uh, that gets carved out because it doesn't match up with the official definition of the code. You're right that typically when things have widespread use, it's fantastic. But again, it's making sure that if you're giving advice to use a particular code, make sure that that code and its description matches the service that you're uh, telling physicians to provide. Otherwise, you might have that mismatch um, with you know not so great results. Can I can I ask a follow up? Mm -hmm. So you, it seems to be a specific example that you're aware of. So that went back into a category three. Given its high utilization, did it then subsequently go back up to a one yet? Or is it still in that process? Uh, we would need to look up on that one. Um, I've, I stopped it at the, at the category three, uh, you know, re-imaging re stage. Um, but I would think if, yeah, I'd have to go back and take a look at that particular example, but it's really meant to, you know, make sure that you highlight um, to make sure that if you if, if you're giving out guidance that you're, services covered by a certain category one code, just make sure that's on pretty solid ground. Because in this case, what it's gonna do is it's gonna create confusion in the market. And you can imagine 
if they had been covered under a category, they've been submitting under a category one code for a while, it's been flying under the radar, uh, you know, reimbursement goes well, and then it goes to a category three. If that changes, it may make it difficult for physicians to say, well, what, what do I do now with this new technology? I'm not quite sure. And certainly that's confusion no one wants. I think while Leslie's talking about a specific issue, I think on the widespread use, I, yeah, I just, to, just to call out that as a conversation that um, we're having, the, the, the rule on widespread use is we ask the panel to make the decision without having a specific um, number. Leslie's giving an example to point out where there are areas for applicants to um, look further at how they're applying, applying that. But that's an ongoing discussion. I say that because it is something we hear from the innovation community and we have conversations with the panel about this. And one of the other things that's very helpful to us is because we've completely modernized the system that supports the creation of CPT, we have more data than we've ever had before in the past couple of years. So for example, the statistics that Leslie was giving to you on the volume of codes, the length of time, that's sort of like all newly available information that we've been able to pour over. So all I'm saying is we have awareness of this as an area for additional further robust dialogue, which we look forward to um, as an area that we know that the innovation community wants um, changes. I'm, op I'm optimistic uh, that we will find a way uh, that will allow us to um, have clarity there that will be uh, predictable uh, for, for all of us so we can know what the bar is. Um, so, but to that end on, on uh, pace of innovation, I'm not sure whether this goes to Kenyatta or to Lori, but you know, how is uh, AMA staying ahead on innovation and, and technology? Um, it seems that, you know, I mean, things do move quickly and this is, uh, you know, we're always looking for, you know, trying to move things. And of course, you know, just to mention, it's not that we're just impatient. Um, you know, we have we have our own uh, set of circumstances, which is that, you know, usually to get these products to uh, any state of approval, it it's, requires a huge team, a huge enterprise with a huge burn rate. And uh, and our investors are, you know, tapping their fingers, waiting for us to, you know, show them the money. Um, and, you know, it's also about the patients waiting, um, waiting for the therapy. And so a lot of them, you know, even if their doctor wants to use it, they can't get paid. And so, you know, that's, that's some of the drive. It isn't just that we're um, impatient, but I am interested, uh, Kenyatta or, or Lori, to, I know that you've got some means or, or, or groups to look at innovation. And so maybe you can respond to that. Yeah, maybe I'll kick off and, and I'd love for Kenyatta to chime in as well. So first of all, um, you know, as I kicked off this, uh, this capstone, pace of innovation is only going in one direction and that sort of increased acceleration. And, you know, we are doing things by one, paying attention to it, researching it, but then also acting um, on it. So for example, we knew pre-pandemic, that digital medicine was, uh, the pace of innovation was accelerating there and it wasn't being adopted um, into, and physicians like digital medicine, they really, really do even pre-pandemic, but they weren't adopting it. What was the issue? It wasn't the coding structures, coding structures were there. It was reimbursement, it was payment. We created um, this digital medicine payment advisory group to literally um, work on those issues to get the coding structures in such a way and then advocate for reimbursement that was extremely helpful. And this was pre-pandemic. So we had that mechanism in place. They work with the same CPT process um, that exists, but that additional advisory group was very, very helpful. That group exists um, um, today. There's other things that are moving at um, a pace of change that we need additional voices to help advise us. And so one of those areas is just, we are very, as I mentioned, concerned about health inequities, technology exasperating um, inequities versus advancing it. And we, we, we know the innovation community wants inequities to be diminished as well. So I was wondering, Kenyette, if you could comment on some work we're doing there. 
Absolutely. And thanks, Lori. Um, you know, as Lori mentioned, uh, the AMA has increased its efforts um, to advance health equity through our Center for Health Equity and also um, just in our space of health solutions and all the wonderful things that, that we contribute to the industry through our work. We're um, working with external equity and innovation experts who are both physicians and innovators um, and developers who are advising the AMA on the opportunities to act on that intersection between uh, equity and innovation. Um, one of the things that we wanna make sure happens in that work is that there are opportunities um, and conditions in health innovation for historically marginalized and minoritized people and communities, but also that we're getting as much information and advice from the experts in the industry on how to make sure that we're keeping the pace uh, with new technology overall. Um, that's serving um, all of our population. That advisory group, the innovation advisory group, the AMA just press released it. We'll make sure in the follow-up materials that that um, is there. Kenyatta just did a terrific presentation to them. We have things like, for example, we have in, going in front of the panel in September is a new taxonomy for AI. And so there were some questions in the chat on, you know, how does CPT account for services like AI when those are being performed by algorithms? Rhythms versus, um, versus the physician. There are code structures to do that that can be valued. There are mechanisms within CPT. And we will look, we know that those will continue to need um, uh, uh, advice, change, modification. Um, we are thinking about things like bias. Are there ways that the there can be some rigor placed around that so that we can make sure that bias is rooted out? We don't have the answers to that yet. And we are going to welcome that conversation and I'm confident, confident this audience um, will have input to that. That would be helpful um, to us. So these are just some additional mechanisms um, that, uh, that we're on top of and trying to put the processes in place because the pace is there um, and we need to be responsive and attentive to it. Thank you. So I've got one, a quick one again, Leslie, and follow up really to the, in the same vein as what we were talking about before. Right, we mentioned before that that, that the company was in uh, in the Cat One high use in an unused code caused caused a, some undue attention. We're used to talking about flying under the radar. How do we best understand CPT codes? You know, how how do we understand them, and then how do we figure out when a new code is needed? Well, uh, I can think of a couple of things, and I'm sure there'll be lots of ideas on this one. Um, but there's, there's quite a few resources in terms of understanding CPT codes. Uh, the AMA website has quite a bit of information just on the background of codes, what the different purposes of the different categories of codes, et cetera. Um, in terms of understanding when a new one, are you looking for when a new one is needed or when new codes come out? I think it's when a new one is needed, Leslie. I've been seeing a, a lot of these. And so I, I kind of teed that up for, for Andrew, but I'll also add that you know, this is a lot of times where we as AMA staff get involved with folks like yourselves. Um, so rather than having to kind of hunt around and figure this out, um, and it's not an area that you're necessarily as familiar with as don't live CPT daily like we do, um, that's what the AMA staff is there to do. So I know, I believe uh, we'll have our contact information uh, towards the end. I think that's part of the slide deck. We'd love to hear from folks who are thinking about, well, do I need a code or not? Um, because we want to make this as easy for you all as possible. Excellent. Great. Well, maybe this is a good time to post that slide with the final um, information. Um, I just want to thank uh, Lori, Kenyatta, Jay, and Leslie. This was truly outstanding. I got all sorts of nice comments uh, in text. I know you were getting all the tough ones from the anonymous. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't me. Um, but uh, but no, I mean, look, this is, uh, as you can see, we got to have a good report here. There's a real desire to um, uh, continue to improve the process. I think you, you're you seeing um, a dedicated group of folks who are, who are just trying to get this, help you get your innovations to patients. And we really appreciate your commitment and the AMA's uh, commitment to doing that. Appreciate the dialogue that you all have brought up, brought to this community. Um, I want to thank, um, of course, Annette 
for her tremendous uh, cat herding uh, that was uh, involved in, in, in getting this all done. Uh, our, uh, our co-collaborators here, Advamed, MDMA, SVB, MedTech strategist, Wilson Sincini, Goodrich Rizzotti, and, um, and especially the, uh, the AMA and our, our partners at uh, Fogarty Innovation. Um, it's, I don't know what that plane was. That wasn't it was Leslie's. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that was mine. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, no, truly an outstanding program. Um, thank you, everyone. And I hope you all got something out of it. And we look forward to more collaborations with the AMA and Advancing Innovators uh, products to patients. So bye bye now, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.